That's a great song. Hope it gets your attention. Thanks, Charles, for bringing it bringing it to us today, old school style. Again, let's look at the. Let's finish. Let's continue to talk about Exodus 19. I love this. This text. This is so awesome. Um, so it picks up in verse five. We just said and, and brought you to myself, and I suggest don't miss the fact that gods don't invite people to come to the, into their presence. Yet the, Yahweh, the God of the Scriptures, invited God's people not just to come into His presence, but to come to His holy mountain. And in fact, when we get to the tabernacle, what is the tabernacle? The tabernacle is God allowing God's people to carry God's holy mountain wherever they go. Because God's real presence is going to be with the people. So it allows them to make Sinai into a portable tent shrine. Now, ultimately, that's going to get carried up into the promised land and will become um, the, uh, the temple. It will ultimately be um, uh, essentially a permanent version of the, um, of, 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 of the tabernacle. But let's look at verse 5. It starts off, so now, or therefore... If, and there's a big if there in verse 5, and this is kind of interesting. Um, if um, you truly listen to my voice and keep my covenant. Um, it's important that you look at the Hebrew on this. If you notice um, um, the, the if you will truly listen, a lot of translations just have if you obey. This is an emphatic construction. It's it's the verb shema, which means hear, and it, and it does mean obey in a sense that if you really listen to God, if you really hear, you're going to actually do what you say. It's not just talking about something you can hear something without doing it. So that's why a lot of the translations will make that obey. But notice the emphatic construction. We have an infinitive absolute version of shema followed by an imperfect. So when you put that together, it's if you will indeed, if you will truly, if you will really listen. It's emphatic language. And keep my covenant. So that what's the response to grace? If verse 4 is about grace, look at what I, remember what I did to the Egyptians. I bore you on eagle's wings, brought you to myself. This is what God's done. What is our response to grace? Well, God invites us then into a, a, a relationship um, that's in the scriptures it uses the language of covenant, which is a, a legal relationship that was used in the ancient Near East to organize a relationship between two parties, usually a great king and then a people. So this covenant is a contextual device, an incarnational device that God uses to explain the relationship that he wants to have with God's people in the, in the ancient world. And this language works. So God invites Israel then into a covenant. But notice the word if. Again, there's a choice involved. Again, I don't know, you know, it's worth pondering what does if mean. It's like, okay, God, thanks a lot for getting us out of Egypt. Thanks for leading us out into, the, into this desert. Thanks for the man and the quail. But we're all good now, God. Um, we're just going to go our own way. Um, again, why wouldn't Israel say yes to this, right, if, based on what God's done? But do notice that this does involve a response. Just in the same way, a, a, a marriage. Uh, both partners have to say, I do. And then both partners have to continue to say, I do. So there's always an if, right? If you truly listen to my voice and keep my covenant. And this, by the way, those of you who like IBS, this ends up, this little section of, of Exodus 19 is like a general statement then that gets unpacked in the Ten Commandments and then in the Book of the Covenant that's coming. We'll talk more about those aspects the next, next couple of weeks. But if you truly listen to my voice and keep my covenant... Now God's going to make promises. Now this is the thing. First, it's an invitation to relationship. So what's the response to grace? The response to grace is to enter into relationship with the God who has graciously delivered us. And God then lays out what that's going to look like. So in a real profound way, I mentioned this in the discussion from, la uh, from, um, from last week, other than this week, is that um, we can understand Exodus is, is sort of a, is a paradigm for salvation. It's both... Um, uh, uh, so justification and sanctification. So this, in a sense, is a sanctifying moment. Israel's entering into a profound relationship with God based on the grace that God has already given to them. So this isn't about legalism. We don't want to understand law, which we're going to get a whole bunch of now. And in fact, from Exodus 19 all the way through Numbers 10.10, 10, Israel's at Sinai getting law different legal materials and cultic materials, a lot of things that we tend to skip over. But notice that Israel isn't saved by the law. 
Israel's response to being saved is embracing the ethos of God in God's character that the law is trying to signify. The law has a missional function of helping God's people to look and, ref and reflect God's character in the middle of the nation. So you don't want to miss that. So that's the invitation uh, to, to, and the relationship. And then if Israel does that, if Israel's going to then be elevated. Notice the global picture here. Um, if uh, you will be for me a segula, a treasured possession out of all peoples um, on the earth because the whole earth is mine or indeed the whole earth is mine or although the whole earth is mine. We have that last piece of verse 5. But notice out of all nations, verse 5 tells us that um, uh, uh, God's people are going to be God's treasured possession. You know, So does that mean that God thinks differently about God's people than the rest of the world? This has been a question that we've been talking about in terms of witness. And, and the answer is, um, um, it's yes and no. Don't miss the language. God's people are God's treasured possession. Does that mean that God likes them better? Um, in some ways, the answer is yes. They're the apple in God's eye. But the whole point of that is this isn't supposed to be a closed set. God's people exist to extend God's blessings to the whole world. And so this, this status is actually available to everyone. And notice how critical it is. This isn't a calling for Israel to become lords over all the earth. I mean, probably many of you have worked for um, some job where you had to work for the boss's kid. And that's miserable sometimes when you get kids that feel like they're entitled to certain things and then they lord their entitlements over you, right? That's not what this is about all, at all. God's mission is, um, is daring, it's bold, it involves Israel becoming a servant nation to the rest of the earth. And, it, and, in, and friends, we'd use that language a lot at seminary, but I'll just tell you something right now. If you don't know that God loves you, that God has your best interest at heart, and that you're God's treasured possession, uh, you're not going to be able to live your life out with integrity as a servant of everybody else because all you end up becoming is somebody's doormat or you'll become embittered. So there's a status here. Entering into relationship with God means Israel becomes God's treasured possession. But it's God's treasured possession out of the nations, but don't miss it, for the sake of the nations. This is a missional calling. It's a high status. And we have to, again, understand that high status so that we can then be ready to embrace the dual vocation that God's going to have for them when we get to the end of verse 5 and the beginning of verse 6. And that'll be part 3. See you soon.